This episode is brought to you by WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. At WeatherGuard, we support design engineers and make lightning protection easy. You're listening to the Struck Podcast. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And here on Struck, we talk about everything aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. All right, welcome back to the Struck Aerospace Engineering Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dan Blewett. Great show today. We're going to first talk about a stowaway who survived a flight from Guatemala to Miami in the plane's landing gear, which is crazy. Uh, so we'll chat a little bit about that and just how, A, that's even possible. I get, that's part of the fifth element. <laughs> you know, he goes through interstellar travel. But here in real life, that seems pretty implausible. Um, we'll talk about the FCC, the 5G rules, and how that dispute is starting to get solved to an extent. Uh, we'll talk about Textron, their new Beechcraft. Uh, Denali T-Prop is uh, out there flying for the first time. And that's actually an interesting little story. And then our EVTOL segment, we've got a bunch of different designs to talk through and big news from Volocopter. So look forward to that. Um, Alan's going to pick apart a couple new designs, and they keep coming, which is pretty fascinating. Um, So, Alan, let's start here with this stowaway. Uh, You know, this Guatemalan man was taken to the hospital by immigration after emerging from the plane. But tell us a little bit about the uh, landing gear. Like, how, how is this possible? Like, I mean, what's the air situation like? I mean, you know, planes, you know, pretty much in in and out. So how does this, how does this work? So the landing gear bays are not pressurized, which means that you're breathing atmospheric oxygen and they're not heated either. Uh, The only heat you would get is from just the heat of the brakes (laughs) as the wheel is stowed. And that won't typically last all that long. So if you're up in in that little hollow area where the wheel gets stored, uh, you're, I, I guess on that particular plane, they, I think they have covers over the wheels, but 737 wouldn't. But, but you're, still, you're still breathing 35,000 foot oxygen levels, which should kill you. It should give you hypoxia in about 15, 20 minutes, you would think. And then the temperatures are going to be, I know they went from a warm place to a warm place, but you're still at altitude. So the temperatures up there are going to be well below zero Fahrenheit and whatever that is in Celsius, it's going to be really, really cold. So you should have a combination of frostbite slash hypoxia unless you could squirrel your way into an area where you can breathe some oxygen or you had oxygen on you. And even still, I think your chances of survival are almost zero, you would think. Yeah, so the FAA actually has some data on this. It says since 1947, 129 people have attempted to stow away in wheel wells or other areas, uh, and 100 have died. So if you have a baker's dozen people, 10 of those 13 are going to die if they try this. That's not a good rate. Yeah, that's scary. No, it's just way too dangerous of a thing to pull off. And I, I kind of wonder if they were really in the wheel well or were they hidden away somewhere else and then tried to pop out of the wheel well trying to get away? Because the the environment there for breathing, I mean, you're higher than Mount Everest, for goodness sakes, right? So <laughs> you, you have to have oxygen or your brain dies and need to have warmth or your body freezes and you don't have either one of those things. Uh, so it's if this really did happen the way that's presented, I'd, I'd be surprised. Yeah, and of course, there's a story from April 2014. A 16-year-old boy uh, survived five hours in the wheel well of a jetliner as it flew from California to Hawaii. <laughs> That's terrifying and crazy. Five hours going over the ocean. Not that going over the ocean really makes any difference, um, but you know, it's still it's harrowing. Harrowing. Yeah, and, and I don't know what makes people think that this is a good idea. Like, why, why would you do it from California to Hawaii? Like, what's the, what's the purpose of that? Well, he was running away from home, apparently. Well, buy a ticket. <laughs> it's a lot easier. Yeah, and it's, I mean, when you land, I guess the obvious thing is that someone's going to notice all the crew on the ground are, <laughs> are going to immediately pick up that there's a random person running around on the tarmac and say, hey, you, especially in today's TSA secure airport world, you can't think you're just going to walk away from that. Well, I guess they don't. So it's, but still, this is not advised. And sometimes I think when they highlight 
uh, things of this sort in the news, it causes, well, it's been proven statistically, it could causes more of it. Yeah. Yeah, there's going to be more copycats of it because someone did it successfully, which means we're going to probably have, like you're saying, probably 10 people that won't make it successfully. And that's not good. Yeah, it's kind of like going over Niagara Falls in a barrel. It can it can be survived, but highly inadvisable. You will almost certainly not survive, even though a couple of people have survived it. So, yes, yeah, stay stay out of the wheel wells. So moving on, uh, we talked a little bit about the FCC and 5G uh, signals and the FAA and how the FAA is worried about uh, 5G and the increased power of these. Uh, and the, and I guess it's more the spectrum and the band. Alan, is that right? Or is this the, the power itself? And, and the power, too. So there's been some movement on that. And AT&T and Verizon, uh, in a letter addressed to the FCC, said they're going to lower uh, power signals from their towers uh, nationwide and then also additionally lower the power limits of the, especially the C-band wireless spectrum when they're near regional airports or helipads. So, Alan, does this uh, strike you as a, as a good solution? Of course, there is no definitive evidence that this has any effect. Uh, they're just worried about it, right? Well, I, I do feel the FAA has some input on likely problems that are going to occur. I, the FAA is really unlikely to start uh, squawking about frequency problems if they don't exist and they have, have some experience with them in the past. So somebody in their technical chain at the FAA has seen this happen more than likely. So the, the, I think that the fix is relatively s- simple. Obviously, you can just, when you're around the airports, just point the <laughs> point the antennas away from the airport a little bit so you don't radiate an airplane, which would make total sense, and lower the power down a little bit. I don't know lowering down the power nationwide makes a lot of sense unless they had extra power that they didn't really need anyway. So they're willing to negotiate down to something they were comfortable with in the first place. Uh, but the, the the real key is around the airports, and that's where you're going to get the most exposure. And that's where, in this particular case, the radio altimeters are used primarily on takeoff, or mostly landing, but uh, yeah, the critical phases of flight, as the FAA calls it, take off and landing. So if you're just careful around airports, that makes a, a lot of sense. And there's a lot of licensing and local issues that will have to be figured out as they go forward. But at least the FAA has a proposed solution on the table, which is great because that needed to happen. So, I mean, is this, this strikes me kind of like the pregnancy thing where, you know, there's uh, so many you know, foods off limits for pregnant women. And of course, they can't test pregnant women like, hey, would you mind eating a bunch of soft cheeses during your pregnancy, just so we can, you know, have definitive proof of what happens? Like, obviously, they would never do that. So is this sort of a a similar thing where they're just looking at at possible things that could have an issue and, and just trying to be extra cautious about it until they, you know, get more data? Yeah, I, th- I think that's possible. You remember that the FAA controls a lot of the frequency spectrum and defines, and the, their, the FAA and their sort of subsequent organizations define a lot of the frequency spectrum in terms of how equipment should perform, how sh- how equipment should react, how sensitive equipment should be. So they they have a really good knowledge of how the spectrum is used, particularly in their frequency bands, and what equipment operates inside of there. And also, they, they do tend to keep a relatively good pulse on aircraft that have had problems with... Uh, you know, emissions, susceptibilities, those things are, are really important, particularly on takeoff and landing. Uh, you don't want any airplane to misreact to some crazy spurious signals. So they, they do uh, monitor all those things. And I, 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 having worked in this industry way too long at this point, uh, there, there's just like this sort of common knowledge, like there's older equipment is pretty susceptible to things sort of out of band. So the, the equipment may work in a specific frequency, narrow frequency band, but it also receives stuff that it probably shouldn't. And because it's just cheaper to manufacture, that's what it comes down to. And in that making it cheaper to manufacture and there was no susceptibilities there or no emissions coming out from some, some random uh, antenna on the ground, it didn't matter. But now that we're using more and more spectrum, it really starts to matter. So the, the older equipment is going to be more susceptible. The newer equipment, as we get uh, evolved, we'll, we'll put frequency blockers in that will eliminate that stuff. So it's only looking at the frequency at which it really needs. That's easy to do with software or hardware. It can be done either way. But 
Uh, I think it's really just an old technology versus new technology, old technology airplanes versus new technology, um, <laughs> all the 5G stuff that's going to happen. Well, moving on, uh, Textron Aviation has their new Beechcraft Denali, which is a single engine turboprop that's going to be powered by the GE Catalyst engine, um, which is a departure from the longtime PT6A series from Pratt & Whitney. Uh, they've made their maiden flight recently. Um, they seem really excited about it. Alan, what's the big deal here about this uh, about this Textron Beechcraft Denali? I think the, it's just the the engine, oh, and it's something that uh, Textron Beach has never really done before in terms of a single engine turboprop. I mean, they had played around with it, the concept for a long time because they've been making King Airs forever, and they've been making Bonanzas forever. Uh, so to make a turboprop version of that, it would seem logical. What what happened is that Pilatus made this a reality years ago with the PC-12. Single engine turboprop, uh, very popular up in Canada and the United States. Hauls a lot of cargo. It's got a big cargo door on the back of it. It seats a lot of people comfortably. It's very efficient on fuel. So it has a really nice niche of a marketplace for the Pilatus product. And Beach never really wanted to dive into that too much because they'd be second to the marketplace and second by a long time, right? So Pilatus has essentially established itself as the single engine turboprop, bigger airplane uh, product. And now Textron is trying to walk into that marketplace with an existing product. It gets really hard if you're sitting in the marketing room going, well, how are we going to sell this new airplane? It looks like a Pilatus. And the answer is, well, we've got this new GE engine. It makes it cheaper to operate. That's that's the answer. Uh, uh, will that be enough of a differentiator? Don't know. I think no one knows. Because Pilatus has that marketplace sort of hemmed up. And so even if Pilatus lost, say Pilatus lost 10%, 20% of their marketplace, they still own 80% of it. And they still got a lot of airplanes out in service. So it's going to take a long time for Textron to penetrate that market, even with a new engine, because it doesn't seem like airplanes really sell so much on the engine as much as everything else, right? It's the avionics package, it's the, the cost of operation per mile sort of thing, or per hour. Those are tend to be more important things. But, you know, Beach and Cessna have lived off of airplanes that are 50-ish years old, for a long time, because they have established the the market space, they established the category of airplanes, and because they were first and they developed the best product over time, really no one wants to enter those marketplaces. But this so it's a little weird that Textron's trying to do something which it knew it wasn't good to do in the past. We'll see. Maybe maybe the GE engine is the is a total game changer. Maybe it is uh, because. Right now, Pratt & Whitney has owned that marketplace forever. The PT-6 and all the variants of which I've lost track of many there are, have been a really high-quality product forever. Really reliable, easy to maintain, everybody knows how to fix it, all that stuff. Uh, so the GE aspect of this is really going to be the, the market differentiation. And Dan, do you, do you think that it'd be like, uh, let me give you a similar situation in a car. If you're going to go out and buy it, a new Corvette, and it just had a slightly better engine. Is that going to make you go out and buy it? No, probably not. Yeah, it's going to, have to be a pretty, pretty big like step change to to warrant that. Yeah, and of course the comments of this article from AV Web are people, you know, are people saying that exact thing. It's like, well, this looks like a green Pilatus PC12. It's like, yeah. So then the question is, yeah, is, the, is there a big price difference? Is there a big package difference? Is the engine make you know a huge difference to the like you said the cost per hour um something operationally whatever uh yeah those are i guess the big questions because you're right if you're just churning out a identical identically priced ipad but your company's not called apple why is someone going to buy that right right you're going to get that 10 20 percent of the marketplace but you're never going to penetrate to 50 at least in the next 10 years you won't and that's why that's what makes this thing unique and i, I wonder if they have a particular marketplace already defined or a customer defined that is a cargo hauler, like a UPS or someone like that, uh, that, would, that would make a lot of sense. 
So moving on to our EVTOL segment today, we've got a couple of new designs to talk through. One of them is from Ziva, and this is one of the for, for sure more bizarre um, designs out there. And this one essentially looks like a eight foot tall disc where the human lays inside of it and it will go vertically up. So if you had an Oreo cookie and you laid it, stood it up end on end, it would then hover or, you know, lift up and then it would start to tilt. And then that Oreo cookie would fly off with you on the back of it. So that's probably the best way to characterize this. Um, Alan, I mean, we've seen a lot of bizarre EVTOL designs. Uh, they're claiming that, you know, this essentially acts like a wing. So yes, even though it's shaped sort of like a disc, um, you know, when flying horizontally, it's going to have, you know, it, it's going to act like a wing, but does this have any chance of meeting mass market appeal? Who is this thing going to be for? Is this just another thing that it's fun to look at, fun to read an article about and look at a design and then we all move on? Yeah, th those aircraft don't tend to go very far because they just visually look unsafe. Not to say that they are, probably are not, uh, but they appear unsafe and you just seem like you're at risk. <laughs> just the way you're splayed out in this Frisbee design with a bunch of propellers near you just seems the human instinct is to avoid danger, even if it, if it's just an appearance sake. And it looks like you're exposed. And if you were to have an accident in this aircraft, which will happen, that you're, you're not necessarily going to walk away with that without any damage. And I, I think that's where, where, where it kicks in on some of these small aircraft is, does it look safe? Is it sort of crash worthy? Does it have backup systems that prevent me from crashing into the ground? If it doesn't, then there would be a very, very limited supply of pilots that will want to try it or owners that will want to buy it. And not to say the technology isn't cool. I think there's maybe applications for it for packages and things of that sort. And maybe that's where they're going is to make something autonomous. But at this point, mass market appeal historically has not been there. Well, one of the things they're talking about, which is, you know, from, again, if you think of standing a cookie up on its edge, um, they're saying you can park six or seven of them in a space and first responders could store them more easily. And maybe there could be a military use where they're just hanging out almost like a jetpack, where run over, throw the backpack on and take off, you know, run over and just get into this thing and, and go, um, which, you know, that's a reasonable pro for this. Like it's definitely more space efficient and, um, yeah, but like you said, I think there's a lot of unanswered questions about, um, you know, how stable it is when it lands. Because if it tips over as the rotors are still going, as the propellers are still going, that's, you know, game over. But um, they have a full scale prototype built and they've uh, on YouTube, they've shown their their one eighth scale model flying. So they seem pretty serious about it. And uh, it's definitely an interesting concept. But it's like like we we both said, it's definitely one of the more bizarre, um, just unfriendly to the eyes. And again, that doesn't mean anything about the engineering of it. It just it looks like people are going to be really skeptical, and that's going to be a hard hurdle to get over. And if you if you think that the military is your application or EMS, which is involves a lot of governmental organizations that will oversee this thing, that's a hard path to go down. I know it seems conceptually like, oh, the army would buy this to put soldiers who are uh, injured in combat, you can toss them in this thing and it'll fly back to wherever. But, you know, the, the, the military has people to review safety and protocol and uh, structures and, and those sort of things. That's a that's a that's a 10 year kind of development run. If they even think it's a, a worthy idea. It's just as a company, if you put the if you start putting the company aspects, the financial aspects on it, it's really hard to sustain a company without having significant revenue for that period of time. And that's that's what kills a lot of these companies is that cash flow dries up because there's just not a lot, a lot of immediate marketplace for the product. And unfortunately, that's you know just the way business rolls. Yeah, and of course, one of the really interesting diagrams that they have, and uh, this is an interesting article from New Atlas we'll, we'll link to, but is this concept of a sky dock for their uh, their Ziva. So basically, you could install this on your, you know, 44th floor, you know, apartment, and this thing is going to go over and connect to it, and then you're going to walk right into your home. 
and this is going to essentially they, they explain that you park it like a barnacle which i think is a good way of uh of explaining it but you know and their idea of that hey you know rooftop space is going to be at a premium in the future is probably correct right you know that's probably correct but i don't know how many people <laughs> would have the stomach for this <laughs> to park it on the edge of this of your skyscraper and then walk i mean it just it seems really really far in the future and like you said that doesn't lend well to funding if this is that far away right because you're talking about infrastructure on the building side to accommodate it and that doesn't exist right now it's very similar to the sort of the ev tall putting landing spots in even putting a simple landing spot in is going to cost you hundred thousands of dollars uh in some cases so none of it's easy it's all about financing and where you can get enough backers to make it happen yeah, not to mention this would be dangling over pedestrians. So one thing tumbles down, kills a person from, the, I mean, from that altitude, anything is going to hit what terminal velocity if it's 40 stories up, maybe, you know, so you drop your cell phone, someone dies below, doesn't bode well for the future of this, right? And, you know, one docking error or you know, anything that's going to be tough. I mean, and, and those are all issues with any flying car that you've raised in all these past episodes that the flying car concept is just really hard to do that in a big city, you know, like, like New York, where there's just so many people on foot below that like nothing can go wrong without a pretty significant amount of casualties. And that's a, that's a huge hurdle. Right. If you, if you pick the most complicated problem and try to solve that one first, that's the most difficult way to create a product. Uh, I'll give you the SpaceX comparison. So SpaceX started out with simple problems, not trying to land on a pad at the ocean, right? They were just like, oh, let's just see if we can, uh, get a rocket into space. And then then they developed over time, like, let's try to land on a landing pad in the middle of the ocean. And then it didn't work a couple of times. And then they finally figured it out. Well, it's a, it's a similar thing, right? In that in that span of time where you're destroying rockets, it's costing you millions and millions of dollars. And the same thing exists in the airplane world, right? That, uh, the, But the problem is you got humans involved, usually, that the risks are so high and the costs are so amazingly... Uh, complex and expensive that you just can't really do it. So you've got to have an answer that fits a marketplace today. Uh, otherwise, you're just out of cash. So moving on, AutoFlight has gotten $100 million in new investment. And of course, they're a Chinese uh, EVTOL company, and they've got a couple different models, all of which look very impressive. Uh, their V1500M made its maiden flight back in October. And uh, it was a short one, but it's on YouTube. You can find it. We'll link to it. Um, and it's a, it's also a, a nice looking aircraft. Um, you know, it's got the couple. Alan, those are. I'm, I'm going to say this wrong. Those aren't boom arms, but what would you? How would you characterize the V1500M? It's got two booms. Um, stealthy looking, looking cockpit. Yeah, and it's very similar to Beta's design, but instead of having the propeller on the main fuselage part, there's a propellers on each of the and the back ends of each of the two booms. So it's just a different configuration, but very similar in terms of its design, except this is autonomous and Betas is not. Yeah, and of course, Autoflight has the V50, which they call their White Shark, which is a good, also a good characteriz characterization for it. It's a, also a handsome aircraft. Uh, and their V400, the Albatross, which is more of an industrial EVTOL, they explain. Um, so they've got a, a lot of nice designs. They don't have that much uh, flight time, but... They continue to get more investment. Now, Alan, is this $100 million? How far, I mean, you've talked about this at length, how far is that going to take them? About a third of the way through certification. Unless unless there's some huge disruptive technology in play here, uh, it'll, it'll get them about a third of the way. It's about a 300 or $500 million event to certify an airplane. Unless you've got... Uh, well, unless they're doing trying to do it in country, it doesn't sound like they are. It sounds like they're going to try to get EASA certification on it. And EASA, unlike the FAA, you have to pay for their help. Uh, the FAA comes free <laughs> on some help, some level. Uh, uh, so the, there's just a huge amount of technology. You got to make aircraft. You get conforming aircraft. I don't know about the EASA part of that. FAA, you would. Uh, so they're um, they're. they're they need a fundraise, you would think, or get some government backing to, to get to the end. And the question is, is there really a marketplace for it? Maybe. And I think that's the hardest part is trying to figure out 
is if you're going to put in a three hundred million dollars, or is anybody going to get some other investment back out of it with with a decent rate rate of return, especially in conditions that exist today, where inflation is five, six, eight percent? It's really hard <laughs> to put it in an airplane company today and think you're going to get that kind of return. But you know, stranger things have happened. Yeah. So let's shift to our our final. Uh topic for today, which is Volocopter. And they have a really interesting story unfolding with their now uh, scrapped SPAC plan. So they're no longer going to go public via SPAC, which they had announced uh, back earlier in the year. And they have this interesting problem now with the 750 or so small crowdfunding investors who'd invested in the company and really got it going back in 2013. Um, Alan, take us through this problem a little bit. What, what's going on with Volocopter? Why did they scrap their uh, SPAC plans? And what's the issue here with the, the crowdfunding investors? So the, the way that the contracts were set up with the crowdfunding investors was they were going to get a 1% return on investment. And there was a time in which uh, Volocopter could basically end the contract with them and just pay them off. And they could go they would go away with their 1%. That was sort of the, the basic foundation of it, which is not a bad way to crowdfund at least you get your money back now you're going to pay for the loss of inflate the inflationary pressure and the loss of your the, the devaluing of your money over time uh the one percent is not going to cover that clearly so you're going to come back with less money than you poured in and of course a key component of that was that each uh crowdfunding investor would get a, a potential profit sharing of 0.0036 percent so there was something there um when the company started making money and of course that volcopter has not made a dime yet, as none of these EVT, EVT oil companies have, right? So that was the other potential piece of the pie for those early crowdfunding investors. So the, the, the Volocopter is at a really weird place at the moment where they can remove the initial investors relatively inexpensively because they're like profit sharing or own a piece of the company. So they can just basically pay them off and d- reform a company under a SPAC. And a SPAC is a, a basically a simplified way to get to a publicly traded company. So you cre- there's a there's an entity hanging out in space, which has applied for all the, the funding rules, and it has enough cash to acquire a company because you never know which SPAC's going to acquire which company. It's sort of like going to Las Vegas and putting, <laughs> putting it all in black. And then... Uh, the SPAC acquires a company, pours in a bunch of money, they reform in this new organization, and then they have all this funding to go off and do what they need to go do in terms of design and certification. But I, I think the, the the marketplace for SPAC has gone down, and the amount of investment in SPACs have gone down. Right, Joby had some issues with their SPAC in terms of what the value initial valuation of it and what they eventually raised. Same thing happened with Archer, I believe. So... If you did go that SPAC route and you were looking for five hundred million dollars, you may only end up with two hundred, three hundred million, which is still a crazy amount of money, but maybe not enough to actually get to the finish line. So now you Volocopter's caught in this. Do you think Dan? They're just kind of caught in this weird space of all these initial investors are going to be upset if they close out the investment, but you can't really get the cash you need into a SPAC. Then what do you do? Yeah, it's not clear. And, and they've said that this is basically going to send a really bad signal to crowdfunding uh, in Germany in general, because if eight years later, you just get your money back with 1% per year um, and not really any of the bigger gains that you're hoping for or entitled to, or however you'd want to phrase it, it's just, uh, it kind of leaves the people that really helped build Volocopter from, you know, a $7 million company in 2013 to a valuation of a, of a billion um, whether or not you agree with that valuation is up to you. But, you know, the company has expanded quite a bit in its value uh, since those crowdfunders helped get it off the ground. You know, there's a good EVTOL pun for you. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's it's, it's complicated. And like you said, the SPAC market has really seemed to, to bottom out recently. Um, it was very hot a year ago. And now it's if you didn't find a a suitor, a company to merge with pretty quick, you got pretty stale pretty fast. And, um, and yeah, so it, it's, I wouldn't say this is surprising given the, the, the climate of, of SPACs in the last six months. 
So, yeah, but yeah, it's unclear what what this says for Volocopter going forward because they've been one of the ones who've been in the press quite a bit. They've been making a lot of moves, showing their aircraft in flight, which is great. They've done a lot of good things that other companies have not. But I don't know where where are they headed now, Alan? I, I think Volocopters has a really good chance of having a certified aircraft being used in multiple spots. And they're, they're talking about Paris for the Olympics. They're talking about uh, places over in Asia and uh, uses over there. So I think they have a marketplace. It's just a question of whether they're going to produce aircraft in a real production standard. You know, they're pumping out 50, 100, 200 of these things a year, selling them at a profit. Are they doing the ride share bit, which it doesn't seem like they are? Uh, how, do, how is this all going to work where they, this valuation that they have currently can be realized because – you know, valuations are one thing, profits are another, uh, and there's not many Teslas and SpaceXs in this world, especially in aerospace. They don't tend to have absurd valuations. We've seen some of them more recently, but that doesn't tend to last long. So there's a there's a unique window in which Volocopter has to make magic happen, right? So they got to, <laughs> and this is the hard part about aerospace. It's a long haul before you get to profitability, but Volocopter's been doing it for a while. But now they've got, they got this increasing window between their subscribers, uh, SPACs, IPOs, and getting profitability. So I'm certain those board meetings are really interesting right now internally because it's a critical point. And there's not a lot of people on the planet have navigated that situation successfully. Uh, I hope that Volocopter does it because I think they have a cool product and I think it actually uh, moves the the product eVTOL world along a little bit to a place that it needs to go to. But unless they can really make these transactions happen relatively quickly, Volocopter could be on shaky ground. And that's that's the scary part, right? Uh, you'd hate to lose them now. Yeah, they've definitely made moves and they definitely have um, it seems like as much vitality as any of these other EVTOL companies. So, yeah, it'll be as it'll be interesting to see what plays out in the next, you know, six months because there's a lot of companies that have had their hat in the ring that don't seem to be doing a lot or they're just working hard and behind the scenes. Maybe they're just not ready to announce everything. But you know, Joby and Volcopter are continually in the news cycle um, and starting to demonstrate flight more and more and more and talk about certification. So. The, they seem like the front runners, so you'd like to see them continue with that momentum and get this. Because ultimately, this the the industry needs someone to actually start flying people or products or cargo, whatever, around to to really start to see that the fog clear. So hopefully, hopefully, this isn't too much of a of a bad sign for for Volcopter. Well, with the pandemic, well, I don't know for pandemic endemic, who knows anymore. But I feel like there's a, just a little short window here of opportunity before the world wakes up and says, hey, I can invest in other things. I'm coming out of my home, starting to work a little bit, uh, that those investment opportunities in these aircraft companies are going to get m much more competitive because they have other opportunities to invest in things that are maybe more profitable. So the, the investment opportunity may be sort of pandemic driven on some level. Can you get a product out the door in the next 12 to 24 months? I don't think that really anybody has a chance at it besides maybe like an e-hang. I'm not even sure what that means, but or a volocopter. Those are kind of the two. Can you get it out, something certified out flying in the marketplace or even on an experimental stage? I think volocopter is it. And there needs to be something in the next 12 to 20, 24 months or it could really damage the image of the industry. Well, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Struck. Thanks so much for listening. Be sure to leave us a review. We greatly appreciate it. And subscribe to the show on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, wherever you listen or watch. Thanks again, and we will see you here next week on the Struck Aerospace Engineering Podcast. Strike Tape, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech's proprietary lightning protection for radomes, provides unmatched durability for years to come. If you need help with your radome lightning protection, reach out to us at weatherguardaero.com. That's weatherguardaero.com.